Good afternoon, War and Peace fam out there in the streets, reading the War and Peace, getting through one of the longest books in Western literature. I hope everyone is doing well, and I hope everyone has a glass of water and is strapped in and ready to go because, folks, it is going to be crazy today. We are probably going to do one of the longest readings we've done. And it's just because, first of all, we're really close to the end of volume three. Volume four is the last volume in the book, and we've made so much progress that we're just going to plow on through to finish volume three today. Exciting. But it's also because that, that what's remaining is either it would be too short of a reading for two days or one really long reading. And I thought, you know what? We're making great progress. We're getting close to the end. You can see the finish line. It's getting exciting. It's getting crazy. Let's just plow through it. Um, especially because, you know, there's some days where I've got done really short readings and I always feel like I'm jipping you guys. So I am uh, going to plow through it today with you. And hopefully some of the sections will move along a little faster than, uh, than maybe we thought. Mm -hmm. And hope everyone is staying safe. Um, and we're not going to spend too much time on a intro today, guys. I usually talk for way too long anyways. Um, but since we have so much to read, I'm definitely going to rein that in, as I should anyways. Uh, and as you recall from last time, um, it's, the, it's the year 1812. Russia has been invaded by the French. The French have gotten to Moscow. Everyone has pretty much abandoned Moscow except for poor families, um, uh, the sort of your laborers, your everyday people. So not everybody. So clearly like the poor um, merchant class and the laborers are still in Moscow, but all the wealthy, all the government, um, anyone who's in any kind of, you know, position of power or wealth has left. So that's not everybody by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, that everyone who is been highlighted in our story as like an interesting character has left, except for Pierre, who is still there. Um, and he's hiding out in the house of his former mentor. And while there with his mentor's crazy half brother and a couple servants, while there, the French come upon the house, of course, because they're just, taking all the houses and staying in all the houses in the wealthy houses in uh, Moscow. There's a French officer. He keeps the French officer from being shot by the crazy half brother. And in turn, the French officer says, you're now French. You are my brother. And so now evidently they're, you know, they're going to be buddies or something. Um, and yeah, so Pierre saved his life and also saved the life of the crazy half brother from being receiving retribution for, Oh, trying to shoot a French officer. So now they're both staying in this house together. Um, hey, I have the live chat up, so feel free to say hi or drop any comments about what you remember from last time or if you have any questions. It was sort of a violent uh, episode yesterday. Um, and, of course, if you've fallen behind, missed a thing, or you just need to refresh, always check out the playlist on my channel for War and Peace that has all the readings up until now, all, like, four months of reading. So I'm really hoping, like I said, that we can get through um, volume four, the final volume in the next month, I'm hoping. So part of that plan is do the super long reading today. So there. So let's jump in. As I said, I wasn't going to talk too long. It's already talked way too long. Let's jump in. So we're reading volume three, part three, section 29 through 34, which is the end of volume three. When the French officer went into the house with Pierre, Pierre considered it his duty to assume the captain again, to assure the captain again that he was not French and wished to leave, but the French officer would not hear of it. He was so courteous, amiable, good-natured, and truly grateful for the saving of his life that Pierre did not have the heart to refuse him and sat down with him in their reception room, the first thing one they came to. Pierre's assertion that he was not French, to Pierre's assertion that he was not French, the captain, obviously not understanding how anyone could refuse such a flattering title, shrugged his soldiers that, shoulders and said that if he insisted so much on passing for a Russian, so be it. But in spite of that, he would be forever bound to him on all the same by a feeling of gratitude for saving his life. If this man had been endowed with at least some ability to understand the feelings of other people and had guessed Pierre's fe feelings, Pierre would probably have left him. But this man's lively imperviousness to everything that was not himself won Pierre over. 
Francais ou prince russe incognito, said the Frenchman, examining Pierre's dirty but fine shirt and the signet ring on his finger. Je vous dors la vie et je vous offre mon amitié. En français, n'oublie jamais ni en insulté ni en service. Je vous offre mon amitié. Je ne vous dis que ça. In the sounds of the voice, in the expression of the face, in the gesture of this officer, there was so much good nature, nature and nobility in the French sense that Pierre, responding with an unconscious smile to the smile of the Frenchman, pressed the hand held out to him. Capitaine Pombal du 13e Léger, de pour les affaires du Sont, he said, introducing himself with a satisfied, irrepressible smile that puckered his lips under his mustache. Vous vendez-vous bien, me dire à poisson, et que j'ai l'honneur de parler aussi agréablement au lieu de rester à leur ambulance avec les belles de ces fous dans le corps. Pierre replied that he could not give his name, and blushing, tried to invent a name and talk about the reasons why he could not give it. But the Frenchman hastened to interrupt him. De Grace, he said, je comprends vos raisons. Vous êtes officier, officier supérieur pour être. Vous avez porté les armes contre nous. Ce n'est pas mon affaire. Je vous dors la vie. Seulement Sophie. Je suis tout à vie. Vous êtes général homme? He added, and with a slightly questioning tone, Pierre inclined his head. Votre nom baptême. S'il vous plaît, je ne demande pas de davantage. Mon Pierre, dites-vous. Parfait. C'est tout ce que je désirais savoir. When the roast lamb, the omelet, the samovar, the vodka, and the wine from a Russian cellar brought along by the French was served, Rambal invited Pierre to share his di this dinner, and at once began eating himself greedily and quickly like a healthy and hungry man, quickly chewing with his strong teeth, constantly smacking his lips and saying, Excellent! Exquisite! His face was flushed and covered with sweat. Pierre was hungry and shared the dinner with pleasure. Morel, the older orderly, brought a pan of warm water and put a bottle of red wine in it. He brought a bottle of kvass beside, which he had taken from the kitchen to, to try. This drink was already known to the French and had been given a name. They called it Limonade de Cochon, pig's lemonade. And Morel raised, praised this lemonade de cochon, which he had found in the kitchen. But since the captain had wine, procured as he was passing through Moscow, he left the kvass to Morel and took up the bottle of Bordeaux. He wrapped the bottle to the neck in a napkin, poured wine for himself and for Pierre. Appeased, hunger, and the wine made the captain still more lively, and he talked ceaselessly during dinner. Oui, mon cher Monsieur Pierre, je vous donne une fille chandelle de moi voir sa voix, de cet engrège. Je ne sais voyez-vous de, de balles dans le corps. Et voilà une, he pointed to his side, un programme était du à Smolensk. He pointed to the scar on his cheek. Et cette jambe, Quand vous voyez, que ne va pas marcher, c'est à la grande bataille du 7 à la Moscow que j'ai requis ça. Sacré du était cette but. Il fait voir ça. C'est un déluge de feu. Vous n'en avez-t-elle un rond besson? Vous pouvez vous inventer non d'un petit bonhomme. Et ma parole, malgré l'art que j'ai I Jane, je serai prête à recommencer. Je pense sur que non pas vous ça. Yes, my dear Monsieur Pierre, I owe you a debt of gratitude for having saved me from the madmen. You see, I have enough bullets in me. Here's one from Mogram, a second from Smolensk. There's this leg, as you see, that doesn't want to walk. It was at the great battle of the seventh on the Moskova that I got that. Holy God, it was beautiful. You had to have seen it. It was a fire, a flood of fire. You carved a rough task for us. You can be proud of it, by golly. And on my word, despite the lick I came in for, I'd be ready to do it over again. I pity those who didn't see it. I was there, said Pierre. Ah, oh, really? Well, so much the better, said the Frenchman. You're tough enemies, anyhow. The great redoubt held out, madame. And you made us pay pluckily for it. I went up in three times, as I'm here before you. Three times we were on the cannon, and three times they knocked us over like cardboard hairs. Oh, it was beautiful, Monsieur Pierre. Your grenadiers were superb. By God's thunder, I saw them. Close ranks six times in a row, and march as if they were on review. Fine men. 
Our king of Naples, who knows something about it, shot out, shouted, Bravo! Haha! Soldiers like the rest of us! He said, smiling after a moment's silence. So much the better. So much the better, Monsieur Pierre. Terrible in battle. Gallant, he winked with a smile. With the pretty women, that's the French for you, Monsieur Pierre. Isn't it so? The captain was so naively and good-naturedly merry and wholesome and pleased with himself that Pierre glanced merrily at him and nearly winked himself. The word galant probably prompted the captain to thoughts about the state of Moscow. By the way, tell me, is it true that all the women have left Moscow? What a funny idea. What did they have to fear? Wouldn't the French ladies leave Paris if the Russians entered it? Asked Pierre. Ah, ha, ha, ha. The Frenchman burst into Mary's sanguine laughter, patting Pierre on the shoulder. Oh, that's a good one. Paris, he said. But Paris, Paris. Paris is the capital of the world, said Pierre, finishing his phrase. The captain looked at Pierre. He had the habit of stopping in the middle of a conversation and gazing intently with laughing, tender eyes. Well, if you hadn't told me you were Russian, I would have bet you were a Parisian. You have that... I don't know what that, uh, and having uttered this compliment, he gave, je ne sais quoi, he gave his silent look. Uh, I was in Paris. I spent years there, said Pierre. Oh, that's quite obvious. Paris. A man who doesn't know Paris is a savage. You can smell a Parisian two leagues away. Paris is Talma, Le de Chisnance, Pontier, the Sorbonne, the boulevards. And noticing that the conclusion was weaker than what had gone before, he hastily added, There is only one Paris in the world. You've been in Paris and you've remained a Russian. Well, I don't respect you any the less for it. Under the influence of the wine he had drunk, and after the days he had spent alone with his dark thoughts, Pierre experienced an involuntary pleasure in conversing with this merry and good-natured man. To come back to your ladies, they said, they're said to be very beautiful. What an awful idea to go and bury themselves in the steeps, in the steps where, when the French army is in Moscow. What a chance they've missed. Your muzhiks are another thing. But you more civilized people ought to know us better than that. We've taken Vienna, Berlin, Madrid, Naples, Rome, Warsaw, all the capitals of the world. We've feared, we're feared, but we're loved. We're good to know. And then the emperor, he began, but Pierre interrupted him. The emperor, Pierre repeated, and his face suddenly acquired a sad and embarrassed expression. Is the emperor... The emperor, he is generosity, clemency, justice, order, genius. That's the emperor. It is I, Rambal, who tell you, as I am, as I'm here before you, I was his enemy eight years ago. My father was an emigre count, but the man won me over. He gripped me. I couldn't resist the spectacle of the greatness and glory with which he covered France. When I understood what he wanted, when I saw what he was making us, was making us a bed of laurels, you see, I said to myself, there's a real sovereign. And I gave myself to him. Well, there. Oh, yes, my dear. He's the greatest man of ages past and to come. Is he in Moscow? Asked Pierre, faltering with a criminal look. The Frenchman looked at Pierre's criminal face and smiled slightly. No, he will make his entry tomorrow he said, and went on with his stories. Their conversation was interrupted by the cries of several voices at the gate and the arrival of Morel, who came to tell the captain that Wurdenberg officers had arrived and wanted to put their horses in the same courtyard with the captain's horses. The difficulty came primarily from the fact that the hussars did not understand what was said to them. The captain ordered the sergeant major brought to him and asked him in a stern voice what regiment he belonged to who their commander was, and on what grounds he had allowed himself to occupy quarters which were already occupied. To the first two questions, the German, who had a poor understanding of French, named his regiment and his commander. But to the last question, which he did not understand, he answered, putting broken French words into German, that he was the regimental quartermaster, that his commander had ordered him to occupy all the houses one after another. Pierre, who knew German, translated what the German said for the captain and gave the captain's reply in German to the Württemberg Husser. Having understood what was being said to him, the German gave up and let it, led his men away. The captain went out to the porch, giving instructions in a loud voice. When he came back to the room, Pierre was sitting in the same place as before, his head lowered in his hands. His face expressed suffering. He was indeed suffering at that moment. When the captain went out and Pierre was left alone, he suddenly came to his senses and realized the position he was in. It was not that Moscow had been taken, 
and not that these happy victors were playing the masters in it and patronizing him, painful as it felt to Pierre, that was not what was tormenting him at the present moment. He was tormented by the consciousness of his own weakness. Several glasses of wine he had drunk. The conversation with this good-natured man had destroyed the concentratedly grim state of mind in which Pierre had lived for these last days, and which was necessary for the carrying out of his intention. The pistol and the dagger and the peasant coat were ready. Napoleon would enter tomorrow. Pierre still considered it just as useful and worthy to kill the villain, but he felt that now he would not do it. Why? He did not know, but it was as if he had a presentiment that he would not carry out his intention. He struggled with this consciousness of his weakness, but he dimly sensed that he would not overcome it, that his former grim way of thinking about revenge, murder, and self-sacrifice had fallen into the dust at the first contact with a human being. The captain, limping slightly and whistling something, came into the room. The Frenchman's chatter, which had previously amused Pierre, now seemed disgusting to him. The tune he whistled, the way he walked, and the gesture of the swirling, twirling mustache now all seemed offensive to Pierre. I'll leave now. I won't say another word to him, thought Pierre. He thought it, and meanwhile he went on sitting in the same place. Some strange feeling of weakness chained him to his place. He wanted to get up and leave, but could not. The captain, on the contrary, seemed very merry. He paced the room a couple of times. His eyes gleamed and his mustache twirled slightly, twitched slightly, as if he were smiling to himself at some amusing fancy. Charming, he said suddenly, the colonel of these Wurtenbergers. He's a German, but a good fellow if there ever was one, but a German. He sat down facing Pierre. By the way, you know German then? Pierre looked at him silently. How do you say shelter in German? Asiles, Pierre re repeated. Asiles and Allemands, Kunterkuft. Comment dites-vous? The, the captain asked again, mistrustfully and quickly. Unterkunft, Pierre repeated. Unterkunft, said the captain, and he looked at Pierre for, the, for a few seconds with laughing eyes. These Germans are downright fools. Isn't it so, Monsieur Pierre? He concluded. Well, one more bottle of Muscovite Bordeaux, shall we? Morel, go and warm us up another little bottle, Morel, the captain cried merrily. Morel bought, brought candles and a bottle of wine. The captain looked at Pierre in the light and was evidently struck by his interlocutor's upset face. Rambal went up to Pierre with a look of genuine distress and concern and bent over him. Well, you, well, we're so, so we're sad, he said, touching Pierre's arm. Have I upset you? No, really, have you got something against me? Maybe to do with the situation, he asked insistently. Pierre made no reply, but looked affectionately into the Frenchman's eyes. This expression of concern was pleasing to him. Word of honor, not to speak of what I owe you. I feel friendship for you. Can I do something for you? I'm at your disposal. This is for life and for death. With my hand on my heart, I say to you. He said, striking himself on the chest. Thank you, said Pierre. The captain looked intently at Pierre as he looked at him. When he had learned what shelter was in German, and his face suddenly brightened. Ah, in that case, I drink to our friendship. He cried merrily, pouring two glasses of wine. Pierre took the filled glass and drank it. Rumball drank his, shook Pierre's hand once again, leaned his elbow on the table in a pensively melancholic pose. Yes, my friend, such are the caprices of fortune, he began. Who would have said that I would be a soldier and a captain of dragoons in the service of Bonaparte, as we used to call him? And yet here I am in Moscow with him. I must tell you, my dear, he went on in a sad and measured voice of a man who is about to tell a long story, that our name is not is one of the oldest in France. And with that easy and naive candor of a Frenchman, the captain told Pierre the history of his ancestors, his childhood, adolescence and maturity, all his genealogical, proprietary and family familial relations. Ma pauvre mère naturally played an important role in the story. But all that is only the setting for life. The essence is love. Love, isn't it so, Monsieur, P Miss Monsieur Pierre, he said, growing animated. Another glass. Pierre drank again and poured a third glass. Oh, women, women. And the captain, looking at Pierre with unctuous eyes, began talking about love and about his amorous adventures. There were a great many of them, which was easy to believe, looking at the officer's self-satisfied, handsome face and rapturous animation with which he talked about women. Despite the fact that all of Rambal's love stories had that smutty character in which the French see 
the exceptional charm and poetry of love, the captain told his stories with such a genuine conviction that he alone had experienced and known all the charms of love and described women so enticingly that Pierre listened to him with curiosity. It was obvious that amour, which the, the Frenchman liked so much, was neither that low and simple kind of love that Pierre had once felt for his wife, nor the romantic love he felt for Natasha and fanned so much himself. Rambal equally despised both these kinds of love. One was l'amour de Carretiers, and the other was l'amour des Negades, the love of wagoners and the love of simpletons. The amour, which the Frenchmen venerated, consisted mainly in unnatural, unnatural relations with women and in the combination of abnormalities that endowed the fe feeling with its main charm. Thus, the captain told a touching story of his love for an enchanting 35-year-old marquis and at the same time for a charmingly innocent 17-year-old child, the enchanting Marquis' daughter. The contest of magnanimity between the mother and the daughter, which ended with the mother sacrificing herself and offering her daughter in marriage to her own lover, excited the captain even now, though it was a long past memory. Then he recounted an episode in which the husband played the role of the lover and he, the lover, the role of the husband. The husband played the role of the lover and he, the lover, played the role of the husband and several times other comic episodes from his Souvenirs de Allemagne, where Asil meant Unterkoft, where uh, the husbands eat sauerkraut and the young girls are too blonde. Finally, the last episode in Poland, still fresh in the captain's memory, which he recounted with quick gestures and a flushed face, consisted in the fact that he had saved the life of a Pole. In general, episodes of saving lives occurred constantly in the captain's stories, and the Pole had entrusted his enchanting wife to him. Parisien de Co, a Parisian woman at heart, while he himself entered into the service of the French. The captain was happy. The enchanting Polish lady wanted to run off with him, but moved by magnanimity, the captain had returned the wife to her husband with the words, I saved your life, I'm saving your honor. He, having repeated these words, the captain rubbed his eyes and shook himself as to drive away the weakness that came over him at this touching memory. Listening to the captain's stories, as often happens late at night and under the influence of wine, Pierre followed everything he said, understood everything, and at the same time followed a line of personal memories that, for some reason, suddenly arose in his imagination. As he listened to these stories of love, suddenly, unexpectedly, he remembered his own love for Natasha, and going over the pictures of that love in his imagination, he mentally compared them with Rambal's stories. Following the story of the struggle between duty and love, Pierre saw before him all the minutest details of his last meeting with the object of his love by the Sukhareva, Sukhareva Tower. Then this meeting had made no effect on him. He had not recalled it even once, but now it seemed to him that this meeting had some kind of very significant and poetic about it. Pyotr Krilovich, come here. I recognize you. He now heard the words she had said, saw before him her eyes, her smile, her traveling bonnet, a stray lock of hair, and something touching, something deeply moving appeared to him in all this. Having finished his story about the enchanting Polish woman, the captain turned to Pierre with the question of whether he had ever experienced the same feeling of self-sacrifice for the sake of love and envy of the lawful husband. Challenged by this question, Pierre raised his head and felt it necessary to voice the thoughts that occupied him. He began to explain that he understood love for a woman somewhat differently. He said that he loved and had loved only one woman in all his life and that that woman could never belong to him. Well now, said the captain, then Pierre explained that he had ha had loved this woman from a very early age, but had not dared to think of her because she was too young, and he was an illegitimate son without a name. Later, when he had acquired a name and wealth, he did had not dared to think of her because he loved her too much, placed her too high in the world, and the more so, therefore, above himself. Reaching this point in his story, Pierre turned to the captain with the question of whether he understood it. The captain made a gesture which said that, even if he did not, he still asked him to go on. Platonic love, clouds, he murmured. The wine he had drunk, or the need for openness, or the thought that this man did not and never would know any of the persons active in the story, or all of it together, loosened Pierre's tongue. And with a maundering mouth, his unctuous eyes looked somewhere into the distance, and he told his whole story. His marriage, the story of Natasha's love for his best friend, and her betrayal, and all his own uncomplicated relations with her. Urged on by Rambal's questions, he even told him that he could what he had concealed at first, his social position, and even revealed his name to him. 
Of all that, Pierre told him, the captain was most struck by the fact that Pierre was very rich, that he had two mansions in Moscow, and that he had abandoned everything and had not left Moscow, but stayed in the city, concealing his name and rank. Late at night, they went outside together. The night was warm and bright. To the left of the house, the first Moscow fire started at Petroko Petrovka, glowed brightly. To the right, high in the sky, was a young crescent moon, and opposite the crescent hung that bright comet in which, in Pierre's soul, was connected with his love. By the gate stood Garrison, the cook, and two Frenchmen. Their laughter and talk in mutually incomprehensible languages could be heard. They were looking at the glow that was visible in the sky. They were, there was nothing terrible about a small, distant fire in a huge city. Looking at the high, starry sky, at the crescent moon, and at the comet, and at the glow, Pierre experienced a joyful tenderness. See how good it is? What more does one need? He thought, and suddenly remembering his intention, his head whirled and he felt sick and he had to lean on the fence so as not to fall. Without saying goodbye to his new friend, Pierre left the gates with, an unste with unsteady steps and was going back to his room to lay down on the sofa and fall asleep at once. Section 30. The glow of the first fire that started on the 2nd of September was watched with, from different roads and with different feelings by the inhabitants of fleeing Moscow in carriages and on foot and by the retreating soldiers. The Rostov's train stopped that night in Maistichi, 13 miles from Moscow. On the 1st of September, they had set out so late, the road had been so encumbered with carts and troops, and so many things had been forgotten, for which people had to be sent back, that it had been decided to spend the night three miles from Moscow. The second morning, they started late, and again stopped so many times that they only reached Great Maistichi. At 10 o'clock, the Rostov family and the wounded who were traveling with them all settled in the yards and cottages of the big village. The servants, the Rostov's drivers, and the orderlies of the wounded, after taking care of the masters, had supper, fed the horses, and went out to the porch. In the cottage next door lay Revsky's wounded adjutant with a shattered hand, and, a terrible, and the terrible pain he felt made him moan pitifully, ceaselessly, and those moans had a terrible sound in the autumnal darkness of the night. This adjutant had spent the first night in the same courtyard as the Rostovs. The countess said she had not slept a wink on account of that moaning, and in Maestici they took an inferior cottage only so as to be further away from this wounded man. One of the servants noticed, in the dark of the night, above the high body of the carriages that stood by the porch, another small glow of fire. One glow had been visible for a long time already, and, our, and everyone already knew it was little Maestici set on fire, by Mamanov's Cossacks. But that, brothers, is a different fire, said an orderly. They all turned their attention to the glow. Didn't they say Mamanov's Cossacks set it to fire? No, that's not, not my stee. She is further away. Looks like it's in Moscow. Two of the men stepped off the porch and went around the carriage and sat on the footboard. It's more to the left. Come on, my stee. over there. That's on the, a completely different side. Several people joined the first ones. Looking at it, bla look at it blazing up, said, said one. That gentleman is a fire in Moscow, either in Sushchevskaya or the Rogoshkaya. Nobody replied <coughs> to this observation. And for some time, all the people silently watched the flames of this new fire blazing up in the distance. Old Danil Danilo Tarant Tarantich, the Count's valet, as he ca as was called, went up to the crowd and called out to, the, to Mishka. What are you gaping at, you half-wit? The Count will ask, and there'll be nobody. Go get the clothes ready. I just ran to fetch some water, said Mishka. And what do you think, Danilo Ver Tarantich? Might that glow be in Moscow? Asked one of the servants. Danilo Tarantich made no reply, and again everyone was silent for a long time. The glow spread and wavered for farther and farther. Lord have mercy, it's windy and dry, a voice spoke again. Look at how that got going. Oh, Lord, you can even see the sparks flying. Lord, have mercy on us sinners. They'll put it out, no fear. Who was there to put it out? Came the voice of Danilo Tarantich, who had been silent until then. His voice was calm and slow. That's our Moscow, brothers, he said. She, our dear mother of white st Still, his voice broke, and he suddenly gave an old man's sob. It was as if they had only been waiting for that to understand the meaning which this glow they were looking at had for them. Sighs were heard, words of prayer, and the sobbing of the Count's old valet. Section 31. The valet, coming back in, told the Count that Moscow was burning. 
The Count put on his dressing gown and went to look. Madame Schloss and Sonia, who had not dress undressed yet, went with him. Only Natasha and the Countess stood in the room, stayed in the room. Petri was no longer with the family. He had gone ahead with his regiment, while, which was marching towards the Trinity Mos Monastery. The Countess began to cry on hearing of the news that Moscow was on fire. Natasha, pale, with a fixed gaze, sitting on a bench under the icons in the same place where she had sat when they arrived, paid no attention to her father's words. She kept listening to the ceaseless moaning of the adjutant coming from three houses away. Ah, oh, how terrible, said the children, frightened Sonia, coming in from the outside. I think the whole of Moscow will burn down. It's such a terrible glow. Natasha, look now. You can see it from here through the window, she said to her cousin, evidently wishing to distract her with something. But Natasha looked at her as if she did not understand what was being asked of her, and again fixed her gaze on the corner of the stove. Natasha had been in this state of stupor since morning, when Sonia, to the Countess's astonishment and vexation, had found it necessary, no one knew why, to tell Natasha about Prince Andrei's wound and his presence with them in the train. The Countess had rarely been so angry with Sonia. Sonia had wept and asked forgiveness, and had now, and now, as if trying to soothe over her guilt, constantly attended to her cousin. Look, Natasha, how terribly it's burning, she said in Moscow. What's bur said, said Sonia. What's burning, asked Natasha. Ah, yes, Moscow. And so as not to hurt Sonia by refusing and also to get rid of her, she moved her head towards the window and looked in such a way that she obviously could not see anything, and again sat in her former position. But you didn't see. No, really, I did, she said in a voice pleading to be left in peace. The Countess and Sonia both understood that neither Moscow nor the Moscow fire, nor anything else, of course, had, would have any meaning from Natasha. The Count went behind the partition and lay down. The Countess went up to Natasha, touched her head with the back of her hand as she did when her daughter was sick, and then touched her forehead with her lips as if to see whether she had a fever, and kissed her. You're chilled. You're trembling all over. You should lie down, she said. Lie down? All right, I'll lie down. I'll lie down in a minute, said Natasha. When Natasha had been told that morning that Prince Andrei had been badly wounded and was traveling with them, only at first had she asked many questions about where, how, was the wound dangerous, and could she see him? But after she was told that she could not see him, that he was badly wounded, but that his life was not in danger, she stopped asking and talking. Obviously not believing what she had been told, but convinced that no matter how much she talked, she would be told the same thing. All along the way, with her wide eyes, which the Countess knew so well, and the expression of which her she feared so much. Natasha had sat motionless in the corner of the carriage and was now sitting in the same way on the bench she had sat down on. She was planning something, deciding something, or ha had now already decided it in her mind. The Countess knew that, but what it was she did not know, and that frightened and tormented her. Natasha, darling, undress and get into bed. The Countess alone had a real bed made up for her. Madame Schloss and the two, Schloss and the two girls had to sleep on straw on the floor. No, Mama, I'll lie down here on the floor, Natasha said crossly and went to the window and opened it. Through the open window, the moaning of the adjutant be could be heard more clearly. She thrust her head out into the damp night air, and the countess saw her slender shoulders shake and beat against the window sill. Natasha knew it was not Prince Andre moaning. She knew that Prince Andre was lying in the same cottage where they were, in the room on the other side of the front hall. But this terrible, ceaseless moaning made her burst into sobs. The Countess exchanged glances with Sonia. Lie down, darling, lie down, my dear, said the Countess, touching Natasha's shoulder lightly with her hand. Do lie down. Ah, yes, I'll lie down right now, said Natasha, hastily undressing and tearing the laces of her petticoat. Having thrown off her dress and put on her night jacket, she sat on the bed that had been prepared for her on the floor, tucking her legs under and throwing her thin, not very long braid over her shoulder, again rebraiding it. Her long, thin, accustomed fingers quickly, deftly undid, plaited, and tied up the braid. Natasha's head, with a habitual gesture, turned one way and then the other, but her eyes, feverishly wide, looked straight ahead fixedly. When the preparations for the night were over, Natasha slowly lowered herself onto the sheet that covered the straw and on the side nearest the door. Natasha, lie in the middle, said Sonia. No, I'll lie here, said Natasha. Do go to bed, all of you, she added with vexation, and she buried her face in the pillow. The Countess, Madame Schloss, and Sonia hastily undressed and went to bed. Only the icon lamp remained lit in the room. But outside the fire in the little fire in little Mystici, Mystici made it bright for two miles around, and there was the noise of drunk men shouting in the pothouse on the opposite side of the street. 
which Mamanov's Cossacks had broken into, and the adjutant's constant moaning could still be heard. Natasha listened for a long time to the sounds that reached her from outside and inside, and did not stir. First she heard her mother praying and sighing, the creaking of the bed under her, the familiar whistling snore of Madame Schloss, the quiet breathing of Sonia. Then the countess called Natasha's name. Natasha did not answer. She seems to be asleep, Mama, Sonia replied softly. The countess, after a brief pause, called once more, but now no one answered her. Soon after that, Natasha heard her mother's regular breathing. Natasha did not stir, though her bare little foot sticking out from under the covers felt cold on the bare floor. As if celebrating a victor victory over everyone, a cricket chirped in the crack. A cock crowed far away. Others responded nearby. The shouts died down in the pothouse and only the adjutant's moaning could be heard. Natasha sat up. Sonia, are you asleep? Mama, she whispered. No one answered. Natasha got up slowly, carefully, crossed herself, and stepped carefully with her slender and supple foot on the dirty cold floor. A board creaked. Moving her feet quickly, she ran several steps like a kitten and grasped the cold door handle. It seemed to her that something heavy, throbbing rhythmically, was beating on all sides of the cottage. It was pounding. It was the pounding of her own heart, sinking with fear, breaking with terror and love. She opened the door and stepped across the threshold and onto the damp, cold earthen floor of the front hall. The cold enveloped and refreshed her. With her bare foot, she felt like a sleeping man. Stepping, she felt a sleeping man stepped over him and opened the door to the room where Prince Andre was. The room was dark. In the back corner by the bed, on which something lay, a tallow candle with a big mushroom of snuff stood on a bench. Already that morning when she had been told about the wound and Prince Andre's presence, Natasha had decided that she must see him. She did not know why it had to be so, but she knew that the meeting would be painful and was all the more convinced that it was necessary. All day she had lived only in the hope of seeing him that night. But now that the moment had come, she was terrified of what she was going to see. How disfigured was he? What was left of him? Was he the same as that? Was he the same as that ceaseless moaning of the adjutant? Yes, there. That was how he was. In her imagination, he was the embodiment of that terrible moaning. When she saw an obscure mass in the corner, and took his knee, and took his knees raised up under the blanket. For his shoulders, she imagined some terrible body and stopped in horror. But an invincible power drew her on. She carefully took another step, another, and came into the middle of the small, cluttered room. Another man was lying in this room on the bench under the icons. This was Timokin. And two more men were lying on the floor. These were the doctor and the valet. The valet rose a little and whispered something. Timokin, suffering from the pain in his wounded leg, was not asleep and stared all eyes at the strange apparition of a girl in a white nightgown a jacket and a nightcap. The valet's sleepy, frightened words, What is it? Why? Only made Natasha approach more quickly what lay in the corner. However frightened and unlike anything human this body was, she had to see it. She went past the valet, the mushroom of the snuff fell from the candle, and she saw clearly Prince Andre lying with his arms on the covers, the same as she had always seen him. He was the same as always, but the inflamed color of his face, his glistening eyes, rapturously fixed on her, especially her tender childlike neck, rising from the turned down collar of his shirt, gave him a special innocent boyish look, which she had never seen in Prince Andre before. She went up to him and with a quick, supple, youthful hand movement dropped to her knees. He smiled and gave her his hand. Section 32. For Prince Andre, seven days had gone by since the time he had come to himself in the dressing station on the field of Borodino. For all that time, he had almost continue, been con, almost continuously unconscious. In the opinion of the doctor, doctor who had accompanied the wounded man, his feverish state and the inflammation of his injured intestines were bound to carry him off. But on the seventh day, he ate with pleasure a piece of bread with tea, and the doctor observed that his overall fever had gone down. Prince Andre regained consciousness in the morning. The first night after they had left Moscow had been quite warm, and Prince Andre had left had been left to spend the night in the calèche, but in Maestici the wounded man himself had asked to be taken out and given tea. The pain caused by the transfer of the cottage had made Prince Andre moan loudly and lose consciousness again, and when he had been placed on the camp bed, he lay for a long time with his eyes closed, not moving. Then he opened them and whispered softly, What about the tea? This memory of the small details of life struck the doctor. He took his pulse and to his astonishment and displeasure noticed that the pulse had improved. The doctor was displeased to notice it because 
He was convinced from experience that Prince Andre could not live and that if he did not die now, he would die with greater suffering sometime later. Timokin, the major of his regiment with the little red nose, who had been wounded in the leg at the same battle of Borodino and had joined them in Moscow, was being transported alongside Prince Andre. They were accompanied by the doctor, the prince's valet, his driver, and two orderlies. Prince Andre was given tea. He drank it greedily, looking with feverish eyes at the doctor straight ahead of him, as if trying to understand and recall something. I don't want any more. Is Timokin here? He asked. Timokin crawled towards him along the bench. I'm here, Your Excellency. How's the wound? Mine, sir? It's all right. What about you? Prince Andre lapsed into thought again, as if trying to recall something. Is it possible to get a hold of a book, he said. What book? The gospel. I don't have it. The doctor promised to get a hold of it and began to ask the prince about what he felt. Prince, answer, prince Andre answered all of the doctor's questions reluctantly but reasonably, and then said he would like to be propped up on a bolster because he was uncomfortable and in great pain. The doctor and the valet lifted the greatcoat that covered him, and wincing from the strong smell of rotting flesh that spread from the wound, began to examine this dreadful place. The doctor remained very displeased about something, changed something, turned the wounded man over so that he moaned again, and while he was being turned, again fainted from the pain and began to rave. He kept saying that they should quickly get a hold of the book for him and to put it there under him. What will it cost you, he said. I don't have it. Get it, please. Put it under me for a moment, he said in a pitiful voice. The doctor went to the front hall to wash his hands. Ah, shame on you, really, the doctor said to the valet, who was pouring water over his hands. I just looked away for a moment. You laid him right on his wound. It's such a pain. I am amazed he can bear it. I thought we put something under him, Lord Jesus Christ, said the valet. For the first time, Prince Andre understood where he was and what was happen had happened to him and remembered that he had been wounded and how, the mo moment the calèche stopped in Maestici, he had asked to be taken to the cottage. Confused again by the pain, he came to his senses in the cottage while drinking tea, and here again, repeating in his memory everything that had happened to him, he pictured it most vividly to himself that moment in the dressing station when, at the sight of the suffering of a man he had no love for, those new thoughts, promising happiness had come to him, and those thoughts, those though vaguely and indefinitely, now took possession of his soul again. He remembered that he now had a new happiness and that that happiness had something to do with the gospel. And that was why he had asked for the gospel, but the position they had put him in, which was bad for his wound and the new turning over had confused his thoughts again and he came back to life for a third time in the total silence of the night. Everyone around him was asleep. A cricket chirped in the room across the hall. Someone shouted and sang outside. The cockroaches rustled on the table and icons and a fat autumnal fly beat autumnal fly beat against his headboard and around the candle with its big mushroom-like snuff that stood next to him. His soul was not in a normal state. A healthy man usually thinks, feels, and remembers a countless number of objects simultaneously, but has the power and strength to select one sequence of thoughts or phenomena and fix all his attention on it. A healthy man in a moment of deepest reflection can tear himself away to say a few polite words to someone coming in and then return to his thoughts. But Prince Andre's soul was not in a normal state in this respect. The forces of his soul were all clearer and more active than ever, but they acted outside his will. The most divine thoughts and notions took hold of him simultaneously. Sometimes he thought suddenly, his thoughts suddenly began to work, and with such strength, clarity, and depth as it had never been able to do, it had never been able to do in healthy conditions. But suddenly, in the middle of its work, it broke off and was replaced by some unexpected notion, and he was unable to return to it. Yes, a new happiness was revealed to me, inalienable, inalienable from man, he said, he thought, laying in the quiet, semi-dark cottage and looking straight ahead with a feverishly wide, fixed gaze. A happiness that is beyond material forces, beyond external mater material influences on, on man. A happiness of the soul alone, the happiness of love. Every person can understand it, but only God could conceive and prescribe it. But how did God prescribe this law? Why the sun? And suddenly this course of thoughts broke off, and Prince Andre heard, not knowing whether it was in delirium or in reality, some soft, whispering voice ceaselessly repeating in rhythm, pity, 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 and then T T, and again pity, 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 and T T. And at the same time, the sound of this whispering music, Prince Andre felt that above his face, Above the very middle of it, a strange, airy edifice of fine needles or splinters was being raised. He felt 
though it was hard for him that he had to try to keep his balance so that this rising edifice would not collapse. But even so, it kept collapsing and was raised again to the sounds of the measured whispering music. It stretches, stretches, stretches out and keeps stretching, Prince Andre said to himself. While listening to the whisper and feeling the stretching edifice of needles being raised, Prince Andre had glimpses of, red, of the red circle of light around the candle and heard the rustling of cockroaches and of the fly striking against the pillow and his face. And each time the fly touched his face, it made a burning sensation. At the same time, he was surprised that, hitting against the very area of his face where the edifice was being raised, the fly did not destroy it. But besides that, there was something else important. It was the white thing in the doorway. It was the statue of a sphinx, which also weighed on him. But maybe it's my shirt on the table, thought Prince Andre. And these are my legs, and that's the door. Why is everything stretching and thrusting out? Pity, pity, pity. T T T and pity, pity, pity. Enough, stop, please, let me be, Prince Andre begged someone painfully, and suddenly his thought and feeling emerged again with extraordinary clarity and force. Yes, love, he thought again with perfect clarity, but not the love that loves for something or for some purpose or for some reason, but the love I experienced the first time when, as I lay dying, I saw my enemy and loved him all the same. I experienced the feeling of love, which is the same essence of the soul and which needs no object. Now, too, I am experiencing that blissful feeling to love my neighbors, to love my enemies, to love everything, to love God in all his manifestations. You can love a person dear to you when a human with a human love, but an enemy can only be loved with divine love. What's That's why I experienced such joy when I felt that I loved that man. What's become of him? Is he alive? Loving with a human love, one can pass from love to hatred, but Divine love cannot change. Nothing, not even death. Nothing can destroy it. It is the essence of the soul. But I've hated so many people in my life. And of all people, I have loved and hated no one as much as her. And he vividly pictured Natasha to himself, not as he had pictured before with her loveliness alone, which brought him joy, but for the first time he pictured her soul. And he understood her feeling, her, her suffering, shame, repentance. For the first time now, he understood all the cruelty of his refusal, saw the cruelty of his break with her. If it were possible to see her just once more, one time looking into those eyes to say, and pity, 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 and tee, 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 and pity, pity, boom, the fly struck, and his attention suddenly raced on to another world of reality and delirium in which something special was happening. In that world, the edifice was still being raised without collapsing. Something was still stretching, and there was that same circle of red light around the candle, the same shirt sphinx was lying by the door, but besides all that, something creaked. There was a breath of fresh air, and a new white sphinx appeared, standing before the door, and the head of the sphinx had the pale face and shining eyes of the same Natasha of whom he had just been thinking. Oh, how beautiful this constant delirium is, thought Prince Andre, trying to drive that face from his imagination. But that face stood before him with the force of reality, and that face was coming nearer. Prince Andre wanted to... Turned to the former world of pure thought, but he could not, and delirium was drawing him into its realm. The quiet, whispering voice continued its measure, pr measured prattle. Something weighed on him, stretched, and the strange face stood before him. Prince Andre gathered all his forces so as to keep his senses. He stirred, and suddenly there was a ringing in his ears. His eyes clouded, and like a man plunging into water, he lost consciousness. When he came to himself, Natasha the same Natasha whom all the people of the, in the world he most wanted to love. That same, same living Natasha whom of all the people in the world he most wanted to love with this new, pure, divine love, which had now been revealed to him, was kneeling beside him. He understood that this was the living, real Natasha, and was not surprised, but quietly glad. Natasha, kneeling, gazed at him fearfully but fixedly. Shona was unable to move, trying to stifle her sobs. Her face was pale and motionless. Only in the lower part of it, something trembled. Prince Andre sighed with relief, smiled, and held out his hand. You, he said. What happiness. With a quick but careful movement, Natasha moved closer to him on her knees, and carefully taking his hand, bent her head over it and began to kiss it, barely touching it with her lips. Forgive me, she said in a whisper, raising her head and glancing at him. Forgive me. I love you, said Prince Andre. Forgive. Forgive what? asked Prince Andre. Forgive me for what I did, Natasha said in a barely audible, faltering whisper. And she began to kiss his hand more quickly, barely touching it with her lips. I love you more, better than before, said Prince Andre, raising her face with his eyes, 
with, it, with his hand so that he could see her eyes. Those eyes filled with happy tears and looked, looked at him timidly with compassion and joyful love. Natasha's thin and pale face with its swollen lips was more than unattractive. It was frightful. But Prince Andre did not see that face. He saw radiant eyes, which were beautiful. Behind them, talking could be heard. The valet, Pyotr, now fully awake, aroused the doctor. Timikin, who had not slept at all that time because of the pain in his leg, had been long been watching everything that was happening and fidgeting on the bench, trying to keep his undressed body covered by the sheet. What is this, said the doctor, getting up from his bed. Kindly leave, young lady. Just then the maid, sent by the countess, who had found her daughter missing, knocked on the door. Like a somnib somnibulist, awakened in the middle of her sleep, Natasha went out of the room and, returning to her side of the cottage, fell sobbing on her bed. From that day on, through all the rest of the Rostov's journey, at every stopping or sleeping place, Natasha never left the wounded Volkonsky, and the doctor had to admit that he had not expected from a young lady either such firmness or such skill in looking after a wounded man. Terrible as the thought seemed to the countess that Prince Andrei might, and according to the doctor quite probably would, die in her daughter's arms during the journey, she was unable to oppose Natasha. Though it was conceivable that, owing to the closeness now established between the wounded Prince Andrei and Natasha, their former engagement might be renewed in case he recovered, no one spoke of it, least of all Natasha and Prince Andrei. The unresolved question of life and death hanging not over Volkonsky but over Russia shut out all their conjectures. Section 33. Pierre woke up late on the 3rd of September. His head ached. The clothes he had slept in without undressing felt heavy on his body, and on his soul lay a vague consciousness of something shameful committed the day before. This shameful thing was yesterday's conversation with Captain Rambiel. Rambal. The clock showed 11, but it seemed peculiarly overcast outside. Pierre got up, rubbed his eyes, and seeing the pistol with its carved butt, which Garrison had placed on the writing table, he remembered where he was and precisely what lay before him that day. Am I already too late, thought Pierre? No, he would probably enter Moscow no earlier than noon. Pierre did not allow himself to reflect on what lay before him, but hastily hastened to act quickly. Having straightened his clothes, Pierre took the pistol in his hand and was about to leave. But here the thought occurred to him for the first time of how he was to carry this weapon outside if not in his hand. Even under a loose caftan, it was hard to hide a big pistol. Neither in his belt nor under his arm was it possible to carry it unnoticed. Besides, the pistol had been fired and Pierre had not had time to reload it. Never mind, there's still the dagger, Pierre had, had said to himself. Though more than once in thinking about carrying out his intention, he had decided to himself that the chief mistake of a student in 1809 had consisted in wanting to kill Napoleon with a dagger. But as if, as if his main goal consisted in not carrying out the thing he had in mind, but in proving to himself that he had not renounced his intention and was doing everything to carry it out, Pierre quickly took the dull, nicked dagger in the green scabbard which he had bought on, at the Sukhareva Tower along with the pistol and hid it under his waistcoat. Having belted his caftan and pulled down his hat, Pierre, trying not to make noise or meet the captain, walked down the corridor and went outside. The fire, which he had looked at so indifferently the evening before, had grown significantly overnight. Now Moscow was burning on different sides. Carriage Row, Zem Zemosboreske, the shopping arcade, Povoreskaya Street, the barges on the Moskva, the Moskva River, and the firewood market by Dogoro, Dorogo Mil Milovo Bridge were burning at the same time. Pierre's path lay across the back lanes to the Pavaraskaya and from there to the Arbat, to St. Nicholas the Revealed, which had long been designated in his imagination as the place where his deed was to be accomplished. Most of the houses had their gates and shutters closed. The streets and lanes were deserted. The smell, there was a smell of smoke and burning in the air. Now and then, he met Russians with anxiously timid faces and Frenchmen with a non-city, camp-like look walking down the middle of the street. Both looked at Pierre with astonishment. Besides his great height and fatness, besides the strange, gloomily concentrated and suffering expression of his face and his whole figure, the Russians studied Pierre with interest because they could not figure out what estate this man might belong to. The French followed him with astonished eyes, particularly because, unlike all other Russians who looked at the French with fear or curiosity, Pierre paid no attention to them. By the gates of one house, three Frenchmen, explaining something to some Russians who did not understand them, stopped Pierre to ask if he knew French. Pierre shook his head negatively and went on. 
In another lane, a sentry standing by a green box called out to him, and only after the repetition of the threatening cry and the sound of the sentry cocking his musket did Pierre understand that he should go over to the other side of the street. He heard and saw nothing around him. With haste and horror, he carried his intention inside of him like something dreadful and alien, afraid, having been taught by the previous night's experience, of somehow losing it. But Pierre was not destined to bring his state of mind intact to the place he was heading for. Besides, even if nothing held him up on his way, his intention could no longer be carried out, because more than four hours ago, Napoleon had ridden from the suburb of Dorogomilovo down the Arbot to the Kremlin, and in the darkest mood, was now sitting in the Tsar's office in the Kremlin Palace, issuing detailed, thorough instructions about the measures to be taken immediately to put out the fires, prevent looting, and reassure the inhabitants. But Pierre did not know that. Entirely absorbed by what lay before him, he suffered as people suffer who stubbornly undertake something impossible, not because of the difficulty, but because of its unsuitability to their nature. He suffered from the fear that he would weaken at the decisive moment and as a result would lose respect for himself. Though he saw and heard nothing around him, he found his way by instinct and without mistake took the lanes that led him to Povraskaya. As Pierre approached Povraskaya, the smoke became thicker and thicker, and it even became warm from the flame of the fires. Fiery tongues occasionally soared up from behind roofs of the houses. There were more people in the streets, and these people were alarmed, but though he felt that something extraordinary was happening around him, he was not aware that he was approaching the fire. Walking down a path that led behind a big vacant house adjoining Pavroskaya on one side and the garden of Prince Grozinski's house on the other, Pierre suddenly heard a woman's desperate cry just next to him. He stopped as if awakening from sleep and raised his head. By the side of the path, on the dry, dusty grass, lay a heap of household belongings, feather beds, a samovar, icons and trunks, and on the ground by the trunks sat a thin, middle-aged woman with long, protruding front teeth, dressed in a black coat and bonnet. This woman, rocking and muttering something, was weeping heartrendingly. Two girls between 10 and 12 years old, dressed in dirty short dresses and coats, looked at their mother with an expression of perplexity on their pale, frightened faces. A smaller boy, about seven years old, in a long coat and someone else's oversized cap, was sleeping in the arms of an old nanny. A, dir a dirty, barefooted wench was sitting on a trunk and, having undone her pale braid, was pulling off the singed hairs and smelling them. The husband, a short, stoop-shouldered man in a civil uniform, with wheel-shaped side whiskers and smooth temples, could be seen from under the peaked cap that sat on his head with an immobile face and pushing apart the trunks piled on one on the other and pulling some of the clothing out from under them. The woman almost threw herself at Pierre's feet when she saw him. Dear heart of mine, Good Orthodox Christians, save us, save us, dear heart, somebody help us, she managed to say through herself. My little girl, my daughter, my youngest daughter got left behind. She's burned up. Oh, was it from this I nursed you? Oh, enough, Maria Nikolaevna, the husband said to his wife in a soft voice, obviously only so as to justify himself before an outsider. My sister must have taken her. Where else would, could she be, he said, added. Block of wood, villain, the woman shouted spitefully, suddenly ceasing to weep. You have no heart. You don't pity your own child. Another man would have gotten her out of the flames, but this one's a block of wood, not a man, not a father. You're a gentleman, the woman patted on, sobbing and turning to Pierre. There's a fire next door, and it leaped over to us. The maid shouted fire, and we rushed to gather things up. We ran out in whatever we had on. And this is all we had time to take. God's blessing and our marriage bed. The rest is lost. I looked for the children. Kateshka wasn't there. Oh, Lord, oh. And she burst into sobs again. My dear wee child, she's burned up, burned up. But where, where did you leave her? Asked Pierre. From the expression of his suddenly animated face, the woman understood that this man might help her. Dear heart, father, she cried, seizing him by the legs. Benefactor, ease my heart. Anishka, go, you vile thing, show him. She cried to the maid, opening her mouth angrily, and with that, displaying her long teeth still more. Show me, show me, I, I, I'll do it. Pierre said hurriedly in a breathless voice. The dirty wench came from behind the trunk, fixing, fixed up her braid, sighed, and walked down the path with her blunt, bare feet. Pierre was as if he had come to life after a heavy swoon. He raised his head higher, his eyes lit up with a gleam of life, and he followed the maid with quick steps, overtook her, and came out on Pavroskaya. The whole street was burned with a cloud of black smoke. Here and there, tongues of flame burst from this cloud. A huge crowd of people thronged in front of the fire. A French general stood in the middle of the street, saying something to those around him. 
Pierre, accompanied by the maid, wa wanted to reach the place where the general was standing, but the French soldiers stopped him. On ne pas, on ne passe pas, a voice cried to him. This way, mister, said the maid, we'll take the lane past the Nicolans. Pierre turned around and walked on, skipped, skipping now and then to keep up with the maid. The maid crossed the street, turned left into the lane, went past three houses and turned right through the gates. It's just here, said the maid, and running across the courtyard, she opened a little gate in a wooden fence and stopping, pointed Pierre to a small wooden wing that was burning brightly and hotly. On one side, it had collapsed. The other was burning and bright flames burst from the window holes and from the, under the roof. When Pierre went through the gate, a wave of heat hit him and he involuntarily stopped. Which, which is your house? He asked. Oh, the girl wailed, pointing to the wing. That one, that was our place. You've burned up my little creature, Kateshka, my precious little miss. Oh, wailed Anishka, looking at the fire and feeling a need to show her feelings as well. Pierre tried to get to the wing, but the heat was so intense that he involuntarily swerved around the wing and ended up by the main house, which was burning only on one side of the roof and around which a crowd of Frenchmen swarmed. At first, Pierre did not understand these were Frenchmen who were dragging something out and who were dragging something out did not understand what these Frenchmen who were dragging something out were doing. But seeing a French man in front of him who was beating a musik with the flat of his sword and trying to take a fox fur coat from him, Pierre vaguely realized that looting was going on here, but he had no time to stop at that, at that thought. The sound of cracking and the crashing of falling walls and ceilings, the whistling and hissing of the flames, and the lively cries of the people, the sight of the billowing clouds of smoke, now frowning thick and black, now soaring up brightly with flashes of sparks, here and there of solid sheaf-like red or sc scaly golden flames creeped up the walls. The sensation of heat and smoke and quick movement produced on Pierre the unusual exhilarating effect of fires. This effect was especially strong in him because at the sight of the fire, he suddenly felt freed of his burdensome thoughts. He felt young, cheerful, adroit, and resolute. He ran around the little wi wing from the direction of the house and was about to run to the part of it that was still standing when just by his head he heard several the cries of several voices and the clash and the clang of something heavy falling next to him. Pierre turned to look and saw the French men in the windows of the house, throwing out the dresser, out the drawer of a chest filled with some sort of metal objects. Other French soldiers standing on the ground went up to the drawer. Eh bien, que, que c'est quel vitsulu? Well, what does this one want? One of the Frenchmen called out to Pierre. A child is in the house. Haven't you seen a child? said Pierre. Say, what's this one singing about? Go take a walk. Oh, wait. Voices said, and one of the soldiers, probably fearing that Pierre would start taking them, taking from them the silver and bronze that were in the drawer, moved towards him menacingly. A child? A child? A Frenchman shouted from above. I heard something squealing in the garden. Maybe it's this fellow's kid. Go to... Got to be a human, you see. Where is it? Where is it? Asked Pierre. This way, this way. Wait, I'm coming down. The Frenchman called from the window, pointing to the garden behind the house. And in fact, a moment later, the Frenchman, a dark-eyed fellow with a spot on his cheek in his shirt sleeves, jumped out of the ground floor window and slapping Pierre on the shoulder, ran to the garden with him. Hurry up, the rest of you. It's beginning to get hot, he cried to his comrades. Having run behind the house into a sand-strewn path, the Frenchman pulled Pierre by the arm and pointed him to the circle. Under a garden bench lay a three-year-old girl in a pink dress. Voila, there's your brat. Ah, a little girl, so much the better, said the Frenchman. Goodbye, my fat friend. Got to be human. We'll all, we're all mortal, you see. And the Frenchman, with a spot on his cheek, ran back to the, his comrades. Pierre, breathless with joy, ran to the girl and wanted to pick her up. But seeing a stranger, the sickly scrofulous and unpleasant looking little girl who resembled her mother screamed and tried to run away. Pierre picked her up anyhow and took her in his arms. She shrieked in a desperately angry voice and began tearing Pierre's hand away with her own little hands and biting them with her slobbery mouth. Pierre was seized with a feeling of horror and squeamishness such as he had ex experienced on the touching of some little animal, but he forced himself not to drop the child and ran with her back to the big house. But it was no longer possible to go back that way. The wench Anishka was not there and Pierre, with a feeling of pity and revulsion, pressed the suffering, sobering, and wet little girl to himself, him as tenderly as he could, and ran through the garden to look for another way out. Section 34. When Pierre, having run around through the gardens and lanes, got back with his burden to the Gruzinski's garden at the corner of Pavroskaya, he did not 
at first recognized the place from which he had gone to look for the child. It was so cluttered with people and belongings taken from the house. Besides Russian families with their chattels escaped from the fire, there was also several French soldiers in various dress. Pierre, Pierre paid no attention to them. He was in a hurry to find the official's family so as to give the daughter to the mother and go again to save someone. It seemed to Pierre that he had to do much more of something and to do it quickly. Flushed from the heat and the running, Pierre at that moment experienced even more strongly than before that feeling of youth, animation, and determination which had taken hold of him as he was running to save the child. The girl had quieted down now and holding on to Pierre's caftan with her little hands, sat on his arm and looked around like a wild animal. Pierre occasionally glanced at her and smiled slightly. It seemed to him that he saw something touchingly innocent and angelic in that frightened and sickly little face. Neither the official nor his wife were in the former place now. Pierre strode quickly among the people, looking at the various faces he came upon. He involuntarily noticed a Georgian or an Armenian family, which consisted of a very old, handsome man with a face of the oriental type, dressed in a new fur lined coat and new boots. An old woman of the same type and a young woman. This very young woman seemed to appear the perfection of oriental beauty, with her sharply outlined arched eyebrows and long face of extraordinary delicate pink, beautiful and expressionless. Among the scattered belongings in the crowd on the square, she and her costly satin-covered winter coat and bright purple shawl, which covered her head, resembled a tender hot house flower thrown out on the snow. She sat on some bundles slightly behind the old woman, and her big dark eyes, dark elongated eyes with their beautiful long lashes, looked motionlessly at the ground. She clearly knew her own beauty and feared for it. Her face struck Pierre, and he hastened along the fence. He turned several times to look at her. On reaching the fence and still not finding those he wanted, Pierre stood looking around. The figure of Pierre with the child in his arms was now even more noticeable than before, and several Russian men and women gathered around him. Have you lost someone, dear man? You're a gentleman yourself, aren't you? Whose child is it? He asked. Pierre replied that the child belonged to a woman in a black coat who had been sitting in the place with her children and asked if anyone knew her and where she had gone. That must be the Anferovs, said an old deacon, addressing a pockmarked wo woman. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, he added in a custom bass. What, what Anferovs, said the old woman. The Anferovs left this morning. It must be either Maria Nikol... Nikolavna or the Ivanovs. He said it must be a woman, but Maria Ikolavna is a lady, said the servant. You know her, long teeth, thin, said Pierre. That's Maria Nikolavna. They went to the garden where those, these wolves have swooped down on us, said the woman, pointing to the French soldiers. Oh, Lord have mercy, the deacon again. Go that way, they're over there. It's her. She keeps grieving, weeping, the woman said again. It's her over there. But Pierre was not listening to the woman. For several seconds now, not taking his eyes away, he had been watching what was going on a few steps from him. He had been watching the Armenian family and two French soldiers who had gone up to them. One of the soldiers, a fidgety little man, was wearing a dark blue greatcoat tied with a rope. There was a cap on his head and his feet were bare. The other, who especially struck Pierre, was a tall, stooping, thin, flaxen-haired man with, a, with sluggish movements and an idiotic expression on his face. This one was dressed in a long, frieze coat dark blue trousers, and big, torn jack boots. The bootless little Frenchman in the dark bl blue greatcoat went up to the Armenians, said something, and at once took hold of the old man's legs, and the old man at once began to take off his boots. The other one in the woman's coat in front of the beautiful Armenian girl and looked at her silently, fixedly, with his hands in his pockets. Take the child. Take her, said Pierre, addressing the, the woman peremptorily and hurriedly handed her the girl. Give her to them. He almost shouted at the woman, sitting the screaming little girl on the ground, and he again looked at the Frenchman and the Armenian family. The old man was already sitting without his boots. The little Frenchman had taken the remaining boot off him and was slapping the two boots against each other. The old man, sobbing, had said something, but Pierre saw it only fleetingly. His whole attention was turned to the Frenchman in the long coat, who meanwhile moved towards the young woman, swaying slowly and taking his hands out of pockets, put them to her neck. The Armenian beauty went on sitting in the same motionless position, with her long lashes lowers, lowered as if she did not see or feel what the soldier was doing to her. While Pierre was running the few steps that separated him from the Frenchman, the tall looter in the long coat was already tearing the necklace that the Armenian girl was wearing from her neck, and the young woman, seizing her neck with her hands, cried out in a piercing voice, La fait, c'est fait. Leave the woman alone, Pierre rasped in a furious voice, seizing the tall, stooping soldier by the shoulders and flinging him away. The soldier fell, got up, and ran off, but his comrade, throwing down the boots, drew his sword and moved threateningly towards Pierre. Voyons, pas de bestis, 
Come on, no stupidities, he cried. Pierre was in that ecstasy of fury in which he was obvious, oblivious to everything and his strength increased tenfold. He fell upon the barefooted Frenchman and before he had time to draw his sword, had already knocked him off his feet and pummeled him with his fists. An approving cry came from the surrounding crowd and at the same time, a mounted patrol of French Uhlans appeared from around the corner. The Uhlans trotted up to Pierre and the Frenchmen and surrounded them. Pierre remembered nothing of what came after that. He remembered beating something, being beaten, and in the end felt that his hands were tied and that a crowd of French soldiers were standing around him, searching his clothes. He has a dagger, Lieutenant, were the first words Pierre understood. Ah, an R, a weapon, said the officer, and he turned to the barefoot soldier who had been in together with Pierre. All right, you can say all that... You can say all that at the court martial, said the officer, and he turned to Pierre. Do you speak French? Pierre looked around with bloodshot eyes and did not reply. His face probably looked very frightful because this officer said something in a whisper, and four more Uhlans separated from the unit and stood on either side of Pierre. Parlez-vous français? The officer repeated the question, keeping his distance from him. Mm. Bring the interpreter. A little man in Russian civil dress rode out of the ranks. By his clothes and pronunciation, Pierre recognized him at once as a Frenchman from one of the Moscow shops. Mm. Oh, he doesn't look like one of the people, said the interpreter, looking Pierre over. Oh, oh, it's all, it has all the look of one of those, these incendiaries, said the officer. Ask him who he is, he asked. Who are you, asked the interpreter. You must answer the superiority, he replied. I will not tell you who I am. I am your prisoner. Take me away, Pierre suddenly said in French. Ah, ah, said the officer. Let's go. A crowd had gathered around the Uhlans. Closest to Pierre stood the pockmarked woman with the girl. And the patrol started off. She moved forward. Where are they taking you, my dear? She asked. The girl. What am I to do with the girl if she is not theirs, said the woman. What does this woman want? asked the officer. Pierre was like a drunk man. His ecstatic state increased still more at the sight of the girl he had saved. What is she saying? he said. She's bringing me my daughter, whom I have just saved from the flames, he said. Adieu, and not knowing himself how this pointless lie had escaped him, he walked with resolute, solemn steps between the Frenchmen. The French patrol was one of those that had been sent out on... Durasenel's orders to various streets in Moscow to stop looting and especially to catch the incendiaries who, in the general opinion for that day among the French higher command, were the cause of the flames. Having gone around a few streets, the patrol had picked up some five more suspicious Russians, one shopkeeper, two seminarians, a music and a servant, and a few looters. But all of the suspicious people, Pierre seemed the, but of all the suspicious people, Pierre seemed the most suspicious. When they were all taken to spend the night in a big house on the Zubovsky rampart where a guardhouse had been set up, Pierre was placed separately under strict control. All right. And there we have the end of volume three. So thank you guys for sticking in. It was really quite the long read, um, but definitely quite interesting. Um, I'm so glad that Natasha has been able to find Prince Andre and even if he is dying, that there's like some kind of reconciliation on both their parts and that they can hopefully, you know, she's like a comfort to him at this time and he's able to tell her that he forgives her and that's all great. And Pierre, oh my goodness, this man, he is getting into all the escapades. Uh, it's just crazy. Um, it's so sweet that he's trying to save everybody, but... And I love that the, the French patrol is out to look for people who are starting fires and looters, but literally they're like arresting the people who are stopping the looters. Whatever. Classic, classic. Uh, that just seems <laughs> like classic uh, military efficiency. What is it they say? Uh, military intelligence is an oxymoron. I only say that because my family was in the military and they said it. So I think it's pretty funny. All right. So guys, we have now finished volume three and we are on to volume four tomorrow, which is the last volume. There is the volume four and a tiny little um, epilogue in volume four. And that means we're less than 300 pages. So 
yeah. A couple of weeks, we could be done. So yeah, thank you all for sticking in and we will jump back in tomorrow. If you have any questions, let me know. Always check out the descriptions of the videos afterwards for links to things that you can do to help other people. And also always feel free to drop a line with some positive encouragement uh, for helping other people or anything, any questions you might have about the reading. And thank you guys for enjoying this book with me. Hope you have a great day. And we will see you tomorrow. Does this mean the pandemic will be over? I'm not sure what you mean by that, but. I had to clarify that uh, comment in the, in the, uh, on the video. All right, guys, have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.